Uh, hello and welcome to another episode of Lockdown Dads. I am James Miller, author of Dads Don't Babysit and editor of WorkingDads.co.uk and father of two. Hi, my name's Ian Dinwiddie. I'm the founder of Inspiring Dads. I've got two children, a 10-year-old uh, and a 7-year-old. And this week we're really pleased to be joined by Dr. Jasmine Kellen, who is lecturer of Human Resource Studies at Ply Plymouth Business School. Jasmine, um, welcome to the show. Ah, oh, thank you. It's great to be here and great to be chatting with you both today on this lovely sunny Friday afternoon. Exactly. It's beautiful. It's beautiful outside here as well. So I'm glad it's, uh, I'm glad it's nice down in Devon as well. It's always sunny in Devon though, isn't it? Always. Absolutely always. <laughs> we, can have a, we can have a West Country loving. I'm from Somerset, so uh, it's a part of the world I particularly, particularly like. Um, almost so as nice as Devon, definitely almost, almost as nice. That's true. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Doesn't that make that's you enemy? Isn't that how it works in the West Country? They're like your enemies, you know, Somerset, Devon, and Cornwall. You know, it's, they're like constantly at war. Is that not how it works? Everyone's we're, too laid back in the southwest. Yeah, <laughs> we're at war against we're at war against the rest of the country. Yeah, oh, okay. that, that keeps us busy enough. <laughs> like Dorset, Dorset think they're the West Country. Hmm. It's marginal. That's how that's how I see it. Anyway, so the sun, is, the, Jasmine, the sun is shining. So, how are you today? I am good today. I'm back in the office, which is really exciting. This is my second day back in the office after, I don't know, what is six months, I think, since I've been back in the office. So I'm really loving that routine. I've got three um, teenage-ish girls at home. So it's really nice to be able to actually focus on work. It's been lovely and quiet. There's been no interruptions. So I've got so much done today. And yeah, I'm really, I'm really liking a bit of routine. And fingers crossed it continues for a little bit longer. <laughs> Is that your yeah. choice to go back to the office? Yes, actually, yeah, we, because we were trying to, we're teaching from next week, but um, I made it sort of two office days, so even the days I'm not teaching, I'm going to come back in the office, just because I just, I was really missing the routine. I do find I get quite distracted at home, and um, the, the, my girls have gone back to school in a very sort of staggered way, but already they've had a couple of days home because of various different COVID reasons, and I'm just kind of getting the vibe that this is going to be something ongoing, so I'm really going to try and stick with the um, staying in two days a week, if I, I'm coming to work as two days a week if I can, just for that, yeah, just for that kind of routine, and just to be able to really focus. <laughs> Luckily, the old girls are old enough, they can be left on their own now, so that's something. They don't like it, and they like to kind of, you know, as children do, say, mum a lot, and kind of pop in and <laughs> see the <them. laughs> But yeah, so it's like, yeah, it's nice to have the routine, nice to be back. How are you guys? Um, who's going first? Who's going first with the you how can are go you? go first, James, this time. Yeah, well, I'll go first, because I am feeling uh, ahead of the curve this week. That is my main feeling this week. Oh, right? wow, well done. <laughs> Two reasons. One, regular listeners. I don't know if there are any regular listeners and viewers, but if there are, they will remember way back when, I don't know, May, June, I was going on about stinky crisps. Stinky crisps was my thing. I was like, <laughs> brilliant lockdown, because you can eat stinky crisps because you don't have to meet anybody. <laughs> Uh, so it doesn't really matter what your breath smells. And did you see this week the news that mint and chewing gum sales have gone through the floor? Because nobody's yes. eating, so nobody's buying mints and chewing gum to make their breath smell nice, and they're all eating stinky crisps. I was right. Stinky crisps <laughs> was a thing about lockdown. There you go. That was You predicted that. You predicted yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That's quite that's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's it's like a little insight into into the the habits the unhealth the, the habits of um yeah people who don't have to see anyone. It's quite mm, that's, yeah, that's interesting, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Go uh, see on it has some good insight there. You see, uh, <laughs> and of course it's uh, it's two years since Dad's Don't Babysit came out, which I've been blogging around. I mean, Jasmine probably should have had a, a co credit on that, but frankly, the amount we quoted from her and uh, used her research. <laughs> it's a, it's um, a good book, though. It's unbiased, but it's a really good book. It's a really good book. Uh, you know, to be honest, if I was to give you a third of the uh, of the, the profits, I'd probably stretch to a pack of stinky crisps and, and not a lot more, but you know. Uh, <laughs> I'll hold you to that. I'll hold you to that. On, <laughs> precisely because we were ahead of our time, because, you know, now everyone's much more interested in dads working and flexible working yeah. and dads who've been working from home. And you know, obviously that, you know, the reason we were using a lot of Jasmine's research is because uh, a lot of it is focused on dads. Um, so yeah, you know, quite, quite, you know, it's been two years since the book came out, but it's it is genuinely more relevant than ever and uh, you know mm -hmm. quite proud of that and, and hopefully we can take that forward and no doubt we will talk about that in a tick but let's mm. just uh, uh sign off the the how are you section with how are you this week Ian? uh pretty good i think i feel um 
feel quietly confident. It's nice and sunny outside. Uh, kids are still in school, um, which is, yeah, I think, I think we just got to hang on to that for as long as possible, really. <laughs> uh, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who works for NHS in London in a management role. Uh, and he told me some things that um, kind of a little bit scary in terms of kind of look, if imagining two or three weeks from now, uh, the world may look a different place in terms of um, number of cases. Uh, the modelling is quite um, disturbing, I think, from that point of view. So en enjoy, the, enjoy the next couple of weeks um, and get your rest, was what his, uh, his boss told him and told uh, a number of other people. So, uh, yeah, so fingers crossed. Um, and all that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it's been quite good. Um, this week uh, I spoke at an event called Flexpo, Flexpo Business Digital, um, which was really good fun. Um, got involved in the Q&A, had people come to my stand, been interacting with the people who, who visited the stand, uh, connecting on LinkedIn and all those good things. Um, I'm doing a presentation next week and I think one on the week after, all about dads, uh, supporting dads as a route into gender equality. So that's been, that's been good actually been uh, enjoying cracking through the powerpoint updating a powerpoint i did last year into something kind of covid kind of covid related as well so a few few bullet points on that side of things and how things might change for the better so we shall see so yeah i'm feeling pretty good actually this week i'm quite happy I need, nice. to, I need to, yeah, I need to update the, the, the PowerPoint too, right? I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, I need to put some COVID slides in there. I need to find some some light stuff on that. But I mean, that very much leads us on to Jasmine's research, it really, mm. doesn't it? Why, we, why we've got you on this podcast. Um, because, you know, dads and gender equality is very much your thing. Is that, that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. Definitely, yeah. My sort of PhD was in this area and I've just kind of been continuing to gather data and explore this issue because it's just I don't know it's just such a problem and just causes so many difficulties for so many families the more people I talk to the more people I interview the more sort of passionate I get about the need to make some sort of change in this area really <laughs> um and I mean we we, we we call this section the path I mean you know we don't really call call any section anything in particular but on the notes it's called the path um, so tell us about your path, how you came to, okay. to, to sort of focus on this sort of stuff. Was there a, a, you know, a light bulb moment where you went, wait a minute, dads are the problem? Or... Yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know about the problem, but yeah, I think there are definitely issues around it. Um, it's really interesting, actually, when you start doing a PhD, and like, because I was previously a HR manager, that's my experience, and before then, and I was doing um, HR manager in various different organisations, ICV, Boots the Chemist, um, NHS, that sort of thing. And um, so when I started sort of working really casually at university, I really loved it and really enjoyed it and thought I want to do it a little bit more. And the only way of doing that is via doing a PhD. So I started off doing the PhD, thinking about the PhD a little bit as a means to an end. And I kind of was thinking, oh, what can I do that's you know not quite so boring and how am I going to do it? And I'm not, I kept looking at topics and nothing was really kind of jumping out at me and I was trying to think what you know everyone kept saying to me think about something that makes you really passionate and I was thinking oh, I can't think about anything I've got any time I don't know I've got three really small children at that point and I wasn't really sure anything and then I started thinking a little bit sort of out of the a box really and thinking about what make what do I really care about outside of work and what really sort of what do I get really gets me angry and I was thinking about this issue of gender equality and certainly since we've had our girls the difficulties that we've had as a family we've both always worked full-time um, that's required a huge amount of flexibility naturally as a family of two full-time working parents and we've just faced so many challenges and so many sort of barriers particularly with my husband trying to sort of be actively involved in the caregiving and I was thinking about that right at the beginning and thinking about lots of conversations that I'd had with other people and start to talk a little bit more about it and found that lots of other families were facing sort of similar issues and then I was thinking oh, I think this is going to be the sort of topic for me and sort of that was kind of building and then interestingly enough I am um, one of my girls was sick and um I was teaching at the time so I was in a lecture hall so um I couldn't be contacted so the school contacted my husband and so naturally he had to go he had a really quiet day it was about four o'clock anyway and because um, they're meant to be an after school club and um they rung him and he said to his boss I'm gonna have to go because I've got to go and um, one of the girls is sick and his boss kind of barked at him this sort of tail and you think about light bulb moment it literally was like this and his boss kind of barked at him and he said what the beep is your missus doing so much you have to go and get the children can't she do it <laughs> 
<laughs> and it was just, he was like, no, I'm going to go. It's, I've done all my work. I've got no meetings. It's fine. I'm going to go. And then he rung me on the way home and he was like, you were going to love this. And, he said, and then straight away, I was like, right, this is it. This is what I'm going to look at. Because I was furious, kind of laughing because I was like, I found what I really care about. And from yeah. then on, that's what I've been exploring and sort of talking to other parents to find out their sort of, what their sort of journey, what their sort of what they sort of experience, and finding that lots and lots and lots of families have experienced that sort of thing, and also it's been a lot worse for lots of families actually. And the sort of upshot of that is is that many mums continue to have the sort of um, primary caregiving regardless of their working patterns and that continues to happen whether they kind of want to or not and then that affects the dads who want to be more involved it affects them it affects the mums who might not who want to share that sort of burden if you like or share that responsibility so yeah that's kind of what what got me into it and what continues to sort of drive me really is this kind of inequality I think for fathers being actively involved in the caregiving yeah interesting there I mean um you raise a few points that I think we've come across over again. I mean, one is, uh, I think we're all three of us interested in dads in terms of their relation to everybody else. You know, it's not about dads' rights. It's about if we get dads to do this, then that frees up mums and, and just makes everything better for everyone. Yeah. Line managers, very interesting. You mentioned the, the line manager saying, you know, why can't you, why can't your wife go and do it? I mean, there's a lot. Line managers are increasingly, you realise, are key to this and the way they react to situations like that. And just the different, um experiences of mums and dads that you know the way that the same same challenge collect the sick child from school yeah. and yet a mum and mum or dad's experience is so so very different um yeah. so yeah lots of lots of points i think we've come across yeah. before um and is that you know at what point because you know a lot of your work has been about dads in particular and men and, and you no know, you coin you know, the fatherhood forfeit that's yep, that one me. of your yeah, that, was that was particularly um related to dads who want to apply for part-time work so that was kind of part, part, part of my phd was about actually dads who want to apply for part-time work to enable caregiving so it was dads who actually sort of i did a sort of um a blind sort of vignette experiment to sort of see actually if um fathers would be more likely or less likely to actually obtain to be shortlisted for a job and therefore obtain part-time work and found that quite significantly fathers who were applying for part-time work were very unlikely to get the part-time role when compared to the mother and then the sort of second part was interviews in which i was exploring that a little bit more to try and find out what are the more sort of attitudinal barriers actually for fathers and what sort of face challenges they're facing when they struggle to kind of be involved with caregiving and so i think that's an, and the part-time the part-time issue was really quite key, I think, because if you are finding a situation for whatever reason, if, if the father wants to work part-time, it really shouldn't be any different than a mother working part-time. But some of the sort of barriers that they were facing, a lot of them were coming from line managers. So they interviewed line managers as part, part of that sort of study. And line managers were sort of saying they just don't really understand why they would want to do that. They wouldn't necessarily sort of really... Um, They'd feel quite negative about that person. They think it's a little bit strange. It's a little bit weird. And um, I just find that astonishing <laughs> that people would think that and that people would judge that. And not only that, that they were prepared to say it to a researcher who was looking at gender stereotypes. And, and they'd come forward to do the research. So you're thinking, if you're thinking about people in the workplace, technically they're probably the good guys because they're prepared to do research, they're prepared to talk about their experiences, they're prepared to say it to a researcher. That always makes me wonder that these things are at the tip of the iceberg because that not everybody would do that. There's lots of people who would not take part in any sort of research around gender stereotyping. So you think if that's the people mm. who would come forward for the survey, then what are all the other line managers getting up to? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a, it's, it's quite scary, really, isn't it? Um, one of the things I often wonder when we have these conversations with with people who believe the same things that we do is that there's a lot of um, shared kind of agreement about actually this is a good thing and that men should be doing more and they want to do more. In terms of the research, Jasmine, how much is there an unmet demand for dads and for um, parents to do things differently, certainly in terms of equality in the home and in the workplace, I guess in particular in the, in the home. Um, and how much of it is something that is a good thing to do and how much of it is people going, right, I really want this. What does, you know, what kind of what kind of research, you know, what does it show the research? Yeah, I mean, that kind of strands over so many different um, 
elements i'm not sure that i could sort of pinpoint one but one of the sort of key things i'd say is if you look at the sort of gender pay gap research there still is a gender pay gap and that's really significant around the sort of childbearing age and i think this is one of those key factors because it often you could often things that, that women will withdraw from the workplace and then men will continue and then that will, then therefore the gender pay gap kind of continues to, to, to grow and i think that's really quite key and also if you're looking at so it's considering our sort of post lockdown i did some research over, over um sort of lockdown period with some of the colleagues at liverpool university and we really found that lots of parents fathers and mothers were finding so many benefits with being more involved in their family involved in their education making meals with their children having walks with their children in a way that they hadn't been before particularly the fathers were saying this so you think there's get i think there's going to be a real sort of demand for it when things calm down after the covid situation i think that you will really see a an massive increase in fathers who want to who say actually and i really do want to spend more time at home i've been there i've seen what's going on i've been involved i've loved it and i really don't want that to go again yeah i mean i i, I was slightly hesitant about the fatherhood forfeit earlier because didn't you come you might have to cut this bit if I'm wrong. But wasn't there a pithy phrase for the uh, the COVID research as well? Was there not some new version? That was of another. Because honestly, I'm just I'm a bit obsessed with this. I'm such a nerd. Um, <laughs> there's been three. So we did have the fathers one, which was looking at building. That was building on fatherhood forfeit, yeah, um, and yeah. which was exploring fathers who make it work. So the fathers who manage caregiving and work. Might be with through flexible oh. work, might be through with just hours. <laughs> that was kind of say looking at the gosh, looking at the characteristics of those sort of fathers. So I interviewed a lot of fathers as part of that project, and um, following on from the earlier research to explore what are the levers really, and exactly what what does that kind of father look like who manages to make it work, and that kind of really sort of cavalier attitude to caregiving was really common. Those the sort of fathers who might be working part time had extended shared parental leave, um, might be regularly finishing early two days a week for the children to pick up the children from school, had a really, really cavalier attitude to other people's opinions about it. And were consistently saying, I don't care what they think, they can think what they want. Mm -mm, it I'm not really bothered. Yeah. I think I think we probably both come in that category, don't we, James? <laughs> I'm just worried that you're gonna have to get the E out on the YouTube video. No, again. It's fine, it's fine. Oh, no. <laughs> You know, I know exactly what word we left out. <laughs> <laughs> was, there not a, um, was there not a COVID version of, of that? Am I imagining it? I, I've, I no, not a, it, it cannot <laughs> a COVID <laughs> version. No, no co okay. co so, yeah, COVID, the, um, the COVID research has been quite consistent that there's, there's challenges for parents working from home with children. There is challenges, but there's also been many, many benefits, I think, and a real sort of strive for people wanting to work more flexibly in the future, not just working from home, because working from home with children isn't necessarily the answer. Yeah. And I'm sure we can all agree <laughs> on that. But certainly there's a strive for being more involved. And I think there will be a real sort of increase in that. Because you, um, I, I saw something on LinkedIn um, that you've been presenting to the House of Lords Select Committee on the long-term impact of COVID on, on parents. Yeah, um, we along with my um, fellow researchers in Liverpool, we, we presented um, some written evidence for them and uh, particularly exploring some of the sort of um, the benefits that people are sort of saying that, they've become, that they are enjoying that extra time, that they're enjoying that, they've enjoyed feeling close to their children, feeling more connected with their children and are keen to look at ways that they can make that work in the new worlds, whatever that might look like, but they're keen to find ways to making it work. And one thing that's kind of coming out of that in sort of discussions with various people that we've been having as part of the project is to look at flexibility and look at the flexibility by default. So building on some of the earlier work that was happening or sort of last year around this, but to really look at every job and be very specific at the point of advertisement, can this job be done flexibly? Rather than saying, talk to us about flexible working, which inherently we know women will be more likely to do than men for a whole management massive amount of reasons, women are more likely to do that. Whereas if you can be really explicit the way which that job can be done flexibly or not, then it's more likely that both genders will be, uh, be prepared to go for that. If you can say right at the beginning, this job is not suitable for term time only, it, but not suitable for annualized hours, but you could do two days a week working from home, 
then people some some people will think right i'm going to apply on that basis rather than applying thinking i'd love to work part-time i don't want to face all those judgments that are going to come with that i'll go into the job see how it goes might get into the job and then think actually i don't really know how it's how it would work and therefore never taking up that option whereas quite often organizations will say we're happy to talk about flexible working happy to work in a flexible way but it isn't explicit exactly what that means which means that many people will then default to actually okay i'll just carry on like i am with a ridiculous juggle that many many people are doing yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we, I want to come on to that in a tick. <laughs> I want to talk about a webinar which will which will tie in with all that. Um, just in a, in a moment, in terms of who who should be campaigning for what, but just to pick up on that issue around advertising jobs flexibly, um, there was some research by Government Equalities Office last year that found that if you, you, I don't know, you, you probably wrote it, Jasmine. Uh, <laughs> that found that you know if you advertise jobs uh, flexibly, you get more applicants. So obviously, you have a wider. Oh. Uh, choose from but I guess I mean it's interesting to you know working dads we've been running a series on on working dads and lockdown and the changes and what people liked and didn't like now we're beginning to think about right how do we make those changes happen mm. I think it's interesting that one of the ways is is then to sort of do flexible by default but I guess one of the challenges around that is getting companies to actually mean it because it's all very well putting on a, a job advert this can be done flexibly yeah that exactly can be yeah Mm. What I'd love to see, what I'd absolutely love to see, is I'd love to see it be mandatory that all jobs have to ha be audited and have a clear outline of the, the ways in which they could be flexible and that to be on job descriptions and it be completely explicit. That's what I would, in the, if I had a magic wand, that's what I would like and I think that would really change things for many, many families because you could be really, really clear if that job's going to work for you and actually think, oh, I, I could just go for that job, it wouldn't affect me, it wouldn't affect, I wouldn't be judged negatively, I could just go for that job and that all, that's for mums and dads because it does exist for mums as well, I'm not saying it doesn't exist for mums but yeah, I think in an ideal world, I'd love to see that. Uh, and what else came out in the research in terms of, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe there wasn't anything else because that's quite a big step. And I think that would make a huge difference alone. But, um, you know, I think beginning to think about the sort of the measures or the changes of attitude or how we make the good stuff from lockdown stick. Um, what, what sort of came out of your research? You know, what would be your, your manifesto? Or are you still working on drawing that up? Well, I think still... Um, I think still we think we're still working on it. To be honest with you, we're going. We've got so much data. We've been absolutely blessed with how much data we've had because <laughs> we had we did a survey and we did a, we did a dive study as well, pair of, of both parents, and we did um, uh, follow up interviews. So we've got so much data, and I think um, it's still quite early days. Really, the headlines are kind of what I've shared, but the rest will be in as soon as we can all get a bit of time after sorting out the students starting next week. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's it's we're, we're we're really really blessed with the data. We just need to really analyse it so we can look at the, the sort of real themes that are emerging. Yeah, I, I'm not there yet. I think we're, we're <laughs> I'm thinking next month we might start trying to to do that bit and start thinking about what these. But you know, I do think there's a as you say there's a moment here and there's a demand. There's really a, is yeah. Need to, need to make sure it doesn't pass. Mm. Um, it's hard yeah. because I'm thinking about kind of any sort of policy changes for example naturally all the politicians everyone's really caught up with covid but this does really feel like it's the time because people are in the moment they're actually experiencing these these many benefits of being around their, around their children spending more time with their children and it does feel like it is really the time but in two years three years when all this is in the past i would kind of i worry that it'll be this will be lost and we need to do something now almost but it's getting people to listen when there's such a there's a pandemic on it's quite difficult to get people to listen to this sort of exactly. discussion isn't it absolutely but this is the moment to do it as you say it's very very tricky uh, yeah you kind of want to it's a bit of a wave isn't there and you think yeah priorities have moved on for government at the moment haven't they or mm. are different yeah. Um, because Helen Watley's um, private members bill la last year was yeah. a was a really interesting from a from a conservative MP to be putting a private members mm. bill uh, that was you know d designed to it was day one flexibility I think wasn't it but I'm not sure that probably got that got overtaken by events last summer with the change in leadership so 
Mm, it did, but certainly a sort of resurgence of that would be amazing, I think, mm. and it would be very, very timely. And actually, I've been having conversations with someone this morning about how is any way that we can do that or I could link into that because I do think it would it's it would be really it would be a great thing to be getting on with. And I think there's plenty of people who would support that and lobby for that. But it's just another thing at a very sort of complex time for people, isn't it? Yeah, but I think I think it's it's all more important that you well we it's brilliant that you've done the evidence. You know, you've done oh. the research that so we've got the evidence to, to show to politicians or, or employers or whoever to say, look, this is the situation, this is why you need to do it. Uh, and, and in a way as the economy goes down the toilet as it's about to if it's not already is actually the moment that we need to be speaking louder to make sure this, this is a good analogy to make sure that these issues don't get flushed away with everything else i hadn't even thought of that i saw it all the way through that was quite impressive uh, bill, isn't it uh, bill, yeah bill back better as one of our james Frith, one of our e earlier guests um in the show i'd say bill, mm. bill back better yeah, and let's like another, another yeah. uh, John Adams, another previous guest on the show, also submitted evidence to the Lords Committee. Can't believe mm. you didn't. I can't believe you haven't read through all the evidence. Oh, it's amazing. There's, there's working dads. <laughs> Who are they? Working dads? They've put they some evidence in as well. And John Adams. It's, really <laughs> no one asked it's, me. it's definitely on the list of things I need to do. I tell you that much. <laughs> Quite I won't read it all. I haven't read it all. Um, I want to sort of. I want to move on to the the tip section, not least because it's just come up that we've got ten minutes remaining, but also because I sort of. There's an issue, my, my tip this week sort of ties in with what we've just been discussing and, and ties in with a, uh, a webinar that I was at this week. Um, it was a, a Global Institute for Women's Leadership, obviously, because uh, I love them and they pay me, um, <laughs> event on uh, the career costs of COVID, um, mm. slightly hijacked by uh, Talk of Men, but, you know, which is great from a working dad's point of view because I can write it up uh, there. But... It, it got me thinking about because Sonia Soda was one of the guests and she said uh, women need to speak up for more rights for dads and she said that's awkward that might make you feel a bit awkward but um, you know if dads get more rights at work if they get more paternity leave and, and mm. more flexible working that actually makes life better for women um, I wrote a blog about it today saying well actually what we need is men and women to speak up together that that would seem the best way forward you know we can we can for each other i think we've been, yeah. yeah that would make yeah. sense mm. uh, but i just wondered i mean it got me thinking i mean that's my that's my tip it basically is um ignore uh ignore your children when they're screaming and shouting because you can uh because somewhere down the line they'll be able to reason and that's when you've actually got to listen to your children when they can cogently make an argument and this <laughs> is you know more widely when it, when it comes to to try and make changes uh, for gender equality we need to be cogent and we need to speak in unison and that's actually when you get things done rather than just having a tantrum um but i just wondered uh, you know obviously you're at the forefront of this jasmine and uh you're talking about dads do you feel awkward or difficult as a woman sort of speaking up for dads to do more and have more rights does that make you feel awkward it doesn't make me feel awkward at all but what's interesting is when i've done sort of various talks at things over the over the last couple of years sometimes I faced quite a lot of challenge and I did a talk once at an international women's day and I, and I had so the, in the q and I got really quite um quite grilled by someone who was clearly quite angry and she was kind of, sort of saying um I don't understand how you can possibly say this your your mother of three daughters how can you be so on the kind of side of men and I was, I was just kind of saying I'm, I, I couldn't be further than the, the case on on the side of parents and I think it's the key to equality is both mums and dads having equality will be better for everybody. It won't be a situation where women all of a sudden it's brilliant and then it's rubbish for men. Nobody wants that, but it will be, it's, it will be, um, it's better for everybody if there's equality for, for both parents at work. And um, yeah, that could, so when she was sort of said that, I thought that couldn't be further from how I feel. It's just, I just, it's essential for that both men and women to have that equality and it'll make everyone's lives easier. Mm. Well, that's what Sonia Soda mm. said. She, she did a journalist with the Observer and the Guardian. She said, you're aware mm. she's written that. She gets pelters for, for writing it. There. You're aware yeah. why you're doing this. Mm. But, uh, but you know, she's, uh, she also said, you know, people like the Forces Society are very much waking up to this now and realising that, if not the final, one of the bits of the jigsaw for equality is to get dads doing more. And yeah, definitely. And for almost sort of for men to be as accepted in the home as women are in the workplace, I think you don't, there's not so many discussions around women being accepted in the workplace as there was sort of 30, 40 years ago, because things have moved on. And you just think actually, it was, if, we, if we can get men to be accepted in the same way, I think that final sort of stage for women in the workplace will, will definitely improve. 
There you go. That's my, my tip yeah. is don't have a tantrum. Uh, Ian, have you got a tip this week? Yeah, actually, th this um, ties nicely into the equality conversation. Uh, it's about WhatsApp groups, which I, I don't think we've actually talked about on this this show, have we? We've we've talked really? in the part. I don't think we have. I, we've we've talked about it. we've talked yeah. about class watch up, WhatsApp groups, mm. uh, and and this week John Adams, who is getting his third plug of the day, uh, <laughs> wrote, wrote a blog. He wrote a blog about why don't why don't more why don't more dads get involved in class WhatsApp groups at school, uh, and then I I shared his uh, I shared his post. Um, in a number of WhatsApp groups at school uh, and some friends groups. And it was quite an interesting one. And it comes down to, there were, there, were, there were elements of stereotypes, but elements of men don't feel like they have to. And I think my, my big tip is get involved in those groups. There were some of my friends uh, who said, yeah, I had to ask to be in there, but I wanted to be in there because I'm a, I'm a parent. And there were plenty of other dads just going, well, no, it's just, it's got to, you know, quite frankly, class WhatsApp groups have got a bit of a PR challenge sometimes in terms of the, the, the level of um, conversation about things just being repeated over and over again in terms of what's going on at school. But they are a really important part of parenting and knowing what's going on in school and knowing the relationships with people and building relationships and just knowing who people are and knowing what's going on in your child's life in school. So I would urge all dads to get involved and just be in there, even if you're going to mute it, because that's quite frankly, mums are muting those groups as well. They're getting annoyed by bad. They're getting annoyed by bad grammar. Um, they're getting annoyed by just sort of the banality of it. But it shouldn't just be mums who are getting annoyed by these things. It's a parenting thing. And I think more, more dads need to step up and, and, and just be seen to be a parent, not just be, you know, not just leaving that element of school life to, uh, to mums. Mm. It's a good, good callback again to me being ahead of the curve because I wrote that piece in the Telegraph last year, about a year ago. <laughs> I'm, 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 off, I'm, off the, I'm, going, I'm going on LinkedIn after this. Go, John, you've been nicking my ideas again. <laughs> Uh, that's very toxic that's what we talked about. I'm not going to do that at all. That would be, that'd be <laughs> awful toxic masculinity. Um, that's when we talked about it, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, Jasmine, do you have a tip for you know parents, families? What would be your top tip? Um, I don't know. There's so many things, but I suppose thinking about it, I think would be for dads. It would be to sort of don't be afraid to challenge the status quo. So if you do, you go to a. a toddler group and people have commented about where's where's mum today why is it mum here is it mum's day off don't let those things put you off keep go keep going and actually say why did you why do you say that and challenge people because lots of people they just they're just making conversation but the conversation often is really offensive to dads who are heavily involved and stay at home dads in particular sometimes it's yeah. it's really really offensive and some of the dads that i've spoke to found it absolutely destroying some of the things that have happened in some social event social events when often I think it's um other other parents invariably mums just trying to be friendly but they're really what they're saying is really inappropriate and quite often it's said in the workplace as well people will just make comments without even thinking so I suppose it's really important for parents and dads in particular to challenge those sort of stereotypes challenge those sort of comments because Nine times out of ten, they are malicious. I think people are just sort of saying it as in, in a conversational way. But actually, the more you start challenging it, the more people will stop doing it in a way that you wouldn't kind of make these sort of casual racist comments. People wouldn't make that in today's day and age. It's not appropriate in the workplace or in the social setting, whereas people will often make these comments about involved fathers. And I just think the more that people challenge it before you know it, hopefully it will stop being so sort of culturally acceptable to say these things. There's a, there's a few examples of that in, uh, in the gender agenda. Actually, this is a bit of a plug heavy podcast, this one, but uh, <laughs> there are a few examples in, in my book, the gender agenda of exactly that saying to people, you know, when they say, Oh, you know, uh, a little boy will play up, grow up to play football. And then you say, well, why are you not a woman? Then I go, oh, yeah, actually my daughter plays football and they, she really enjoys it. You know, it's just, just, yeah. yeah. Don't have to be offensive with it, but just challenge it gently, and, and you can. Yes, exactly. Yeah. People nine times out of ten, it's just somebody trying to make conversation yeah. and be friendly. But it's just the way that they're doing it can be quite offensive and can be very easily taken the wrong way, and can be quite sort of soul destroying for people sometimes. Yeah. And certainly, people that I've interviewed have found that. They need to, right, they need to chat. They need to challenge, the challenge their inner effort, dad. I think. <laughs> effort, no. dad. Oh yes, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's all they need. <laughs> you would just be talking about yeah. that. Exactly. Yeah, it's a call. Cool, I think it's a callback. I didn't involve one of my books. I wasn't paying attention to that because it didn't involve one of my books. Uh, I'm joking. Uh, 
Thank you everyone for being here for episode number 17 of Lockdown Dads. Um, I've been Ian Dinwiddie. It's been great to have just Dr. Jasmine Kelland here with us. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you next week when we have another fantastic guest to join us on the Lockdown Dads show.